I have the pleasure to welcome to the stage Maria Filipova, Sumit Jumuar, and Vijay Mugapan. And, but before I do, I want to ask you, um, uh, I'm not able to advance. What do you think this is? What is this representing? Any guesses? The stock market. Huh. What? Well, population growth? That's a good, good, good idea. What else? Huh? Quality of healthcare. Well, that's a good guess, Lisa, because the next section is on healthcare. You're right. It's close. This is uh, age expectancy, life expectancy, life expectancy in the world. And you see the broad distribution of life expectancies having gone down a little bit in the United States recently, which is shocking. So in any case, I'm pleased to hand the floor over to Maria Filipova, Chief Innovation Officer at CareQuest Innovation Partners, who also has been an accomplished intrapreneur at uh, Anthem Healthcare before. Uh, I, I'd also say an entrepreneur uh, at heart throughout her entire career. And at CareQuest, they're just starting to deploy, you'll tell us about this, a $40 million early stage fund for breakthrough health. And uh, I'll let Maria, Sumit, and Vijay introduce themselves and their organizations. Uh, the stage is yours. Could I head the clicker? Yep. That would be helpful. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right. Well, oh. let's start with a... Um... Hi. Let's start with a quick question. Show of hands to see if the caffeine has kicked in today. How many of you are working on a technology or an innovative solution and you're trying to adopt it in your industry or at scale? Show of hands. All right. Well, we are in a uh, in good company. Um, I've been doing that for the better part of my career in healthcare. I still have the battle scars to show it. And I'm currently doing that in dental care. For those of you in the audience who don't have the pleasure of dealing with the US healthcare system, um, dental care and medical care in the US are two different things that we need them both for healthy patient or healthy life, yet we act as if they don't exist and patiently and very consistently ignore, ignore them. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but to Rob's point, what we wanted to talk about a little bit today is scaling innovation, or in Rob's words, transcending at scale. Next year, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. It took us 13 years, $3 billion, and a hell of a global effort to map the 3 billion letters of a single genome. And then promptly took us more than 18 years to 20 years to make that full genome sequencing affordable and accessible for the people who need it. Today, you could get a full genome sequence for about $1,000, $2,000 in the US. Now, there's other examples. And Guy here in the first row has very uh, poignantly reminded us yesterday, LASIK surgery. Who, any show of hands, people in the audience who had LASIK? All right. LASIK surgery was approved by the FDA in 1999. Any guesses next year, the following year in 2000, how many LASIK surgeries were performed? Guy, you're not allowed to answer that question. 1.4 million. All right. That's also transcending at scale. In dental care, as I said, the last innovation, or transcending at scale, happened 75 years ago, 1945, when we discovered the fluoride has properties that prevent cavities, and we put it in the drinking water in Michigan. That was the last innovation at scale in dental. And so when we think about transcending, and we think about transcending at scale across industries, doesn't matter if it's healthcare or dental care or fossil free air travel 
as my, our, my friend Maria is going to talk to us about tomorrow. There's certain parts where technology runs out of options to help us solve these wicked problems. And eventually, it's about people, it's about incentives, it's about business models and behavior changes. And that's where we spend the majority of our time yesterday during our purpose session, talking about how do we overcome those barriers to adoption so we transcend at scale. And still, as we know in healthcare, there's a lot of, uh, some of these uh, industries have devo developed very robust antibodies to innovation, as I call them. So over the next couple of minutes, um, between myself and Vijay, who is a self-described recovering healthcare executive from health plans and providers, and Sumit, who spent the better part of his career at the cutting edge of science and genomic sequencing and making it widely, av widely available, will share with you the straight talk about what we believe makes a difference between a shiny new technology with potential and transcending transformative solution at scale. We'll do that for healthcare. Our intent is to give you a bit of the myth and reality. And specifically, when it comes to healthcare, we would focus on those three areas. Digitizing health is a trend that transcends health as an industry. Multiple industries are going through digitization in different speeds. Integrated care or bridging silos and multidisciplinary thinking is another example that frankly is not only a healthcare challenge. And health equity, I'm just gonna say that. Not, not, we don't need to say more how pertinent and important that is. So I'll start with Vijay and we'll dig, dig into the digital health component of it. So DJ, these are the three myths that I would describe or I would actually ask you if they're reality or, or hype. But yesterday during our purpose session, we talked about what is digitizing health or any industry actually means? And is it purely taking what you currently do today and putting on the web? Um, or is it more than that? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's more than that, right? Um, uh, but I will say, yeah, uh, healthcare is slow, but not as slow as uh, cricket has made it to the U.S. <laughs> in like 150 plus years, okay? So, you know, we've got one thing that we're better at. That's right. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I think digital health um, uh, is uh, has been in the market for a, for a while, right? And it... Um, may not be visible uh, to a lot of us. Um, but uh, you know, I'll give an example um, of how technology has really helped uh, uh, improve care delivery. And it was really, it was uh, kind of an aha moment for me. Um, uh, 13 years ago, you know, about you know, two weeks from now, my kids will have their 13th birthday. Uh, they're twins. And um, they were four and a half pounds and five and a half pounds when they were born. Um, my son was kind of this big, and he was under uh, the giraffe, right? So his, his body couldn't maintain, uh, uh, self-maintain heat, so they had to put him under these lights, and uh, it would precisely you know, uh, you know, get, get at the right precise, precise temperature, right? So this little baby is hooked up in all of this. I was talking to uh, my wife, who's a pediatrician, and I said, you know, what is this, you know, how does, like, yeah, she was saying that this giraffe machine is new, right, it, relatively. And I was asking her, what happened to kids like 15, 20 years ago um, that didn't, when this technology didn't exist? Um, she said, well, they just didn't make it, right? Um, so technology has helped uh, in different ways um, improve uh, care. Um, most recently, yeah, digital technology, artificial intelligence, has actually uh, started to uh, drive a lot of care. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of at this tipping point of scale. One example is a client that we work with, uh, K-Health. Um, it's a company based out of Israel um, that has used about 20 years uh, worth of claims data, uh, medical history, uh, to come up with uh, an AI uh, chatbot where you can have almost like a you know, chat 
uh, conversation with uh, the AI. Um, it walks you through symptoms, asks you a number of questions, and um, then yeah, does something that we're all very familiar with uh, at Amazon, says 72% yeah, of people that presented with these symptoms um, took a, a painkiller and went to bed and uh, it was okay, right? 2% had this kind of uh, uh, diagnosis, 4% uh, did something else. Um, would you like to talk to a doctor? And when you say, yes, I'd like to talk to a doctor, it seamlessly transitions that uh, text interface and you're texting with a physician who's now got all the uh, history that you've uh, shared with the AI, which is presented to the physician at the back end. So it creates this um, you know, seamless uh, conversation um, and you know, it, it saves um, the patient uh, time to call, set up an appointment, drive there, uh, sit in the waiting room, then sit in the smaller waiting room, uh, and then have a two minute conversation with, uh, with the doctor. Right? So you know, it, it, it's not just convenience, um, but it uh, also significantly reduces cost. One of the things that um, uh, you know, solutions like uh, AI-driven uh, symptom triage, um, uh, they drive about you know, 60 to 70 percent of the interactions kind of end with the AI. They don't move past mm -hmm. that uh, to the doctor. So think about all of these um, unnecessary doctor visits um, that uh, uh, we've reduced allowing um, physicians, nurse practitioners, other uh, clinicians to operate at kind of at the top of their licensure, right? So they're dealing with uh, real um, long-term issues um, and not uh, short-term. So that's a great example of uh, something that's um, uh, you know, been uh, yeah, tested, tried in the market, about four million uh, users uh, have been using it. And um, some of our uh, payer clients uh, have started to incorporate that into their insurance products. So now it's ready to you know, get yeah. to scale, right? So your former employer, Anthem's got 40 million members uh, that have access to it. That's so great. I think there's you know, great I may opportunity. Have, I may have yeah. had something to do with it. And yeah, what, we are, what we're talking about here is really transcending, um, what transcending means in digital health. And, and the point you're making is, is valid. It's about doing things that you couldn't do before scaling technologies and expanding the reach of the care team That's right. to act to areas and um, venues that weren't accessible before. I do want to talk about these other two um, myths here. Um, how do we scale digital and health? And, from it, and what do we need to do from the payer provider side, or is it somebody else? Yeah that, yeah, could, that would play a pivotal role in that. Yeah, I think all of them will play uh, significant roles, right? But the, the innovation is, is difficult to come from the incumbents, uh, the payers and providers. I think they're the ones that can help scale it, yep. but they can't uh, create it. Um, as Maria mentioned, um, yeah, I worked for uh, uh, large health insurance companies. So I've been at the belly of the beast. Uh, I've also got some Stockholm syndrome. I empathize with the beast. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but because everyone's trying to do the right thing, right? So it's a, this, the, the beast is made of people, right? And, and, and we're all trying to do the right thing. Um, but the business model, as you mentioned before, is, is set up to be um, uh, with, with very conflicting mm -hmm. um, uh, priorities uh, and incentives. So um, uh, what Tell us about the intermediaries, yeah, the little uh, known, the, the yeah. Probably the X factor right. in this equation. Yeah, and, and yeah, so we talk about payers and providers are kind of at the, uh, at the most visible forefront of uh, uh, you know, healthcare uh, delivery, but there are, you know, the system's made with a ton of intermediaries, right? So as an example, uh, you know, one of the largest, the largest healthcare company is, uh, is McKesson, right? It's a Fortune 3 company um, that uh, many of us don't have visibility to uh, but they're the ones that move things in the back. Um, and uh, so uh, I think it's, it'll be the, the, the startups that'll innovate. It'll be uh, the payers, providers, and intermediaries that'll help scale it. That's great. Um, and I hope we don't need to really uh, belabor the last point. And I'm hoping that everybody here understands that digital is here to stay. 
Um, Ishapiro, my friend, reminded us last, uh, last yesterday in a session that even though we have seen a huge drop in telehealth visits, now that we're back in person and eager to go and see each other, um, we're still at a um, multifold increase in digital visits in telehealth, and it's still a trillion dollar opportunity with 15% of patients still seeing their physicians virtually. And so there's a place for digital. Yep. There's a place for digital post-pandemic, um, as long as we are using it to transcend and do things that are slightly different. I do want to point, um, I do want to show you some of our thinking around uh, integrated care, and I'll make a. Um, I'll, I have to give you a confession. Yesterday we we thought we'll spend an hour in our purpose session talking about integrated care, and it took us exactly five minutes to start talking about business models and incentives and follow the money and who has the decision making powers. And fundamentally, what it comes down to is, for number one, we need to understand that integrated care is not about only about data interoperability or can my medical record talk to your medical record. Integrated care starts to draw connections between dental care, medical care, vision, where that patient lives, what they eat, who do they socialize with, the number of grocery stores on their, in their neighborhood, the number of liquor stores in their neighborhood. And there is this misnomer or misperception that in order for us to dot connect all these unrelated variables, it takes a lot of time and it's expensive. The reality is, and what we would argue, is that not connecting the dots is in fact more expensive. The city of Boston ran a study that estimated that the cost of one homeless person to the city bu uh, budget is $40,000 a year between emergency room visits, vandalism, police. How many of you have uh, read the uh, Million Dollar Mary uh, article by Malcolm Gladwell? Judge Leifman yesterday reminded of, us, of, us, of, of that article. Um, a study followed a homeless person over a year, over actually over 10 years, and they accumulated all the costs between um, what they call useless interventions, between jail, between staying in police, medical records. Over 10 years, that person cost $1 million to the system in Nevada. Right? Two studies that show us that if we actually know how to account for the cost, the true cost, it way exceeds the IT spend on getting my system to talk to your system. Let me give you another example on the dental side. 60% of low-income and uh, non-Hispanic black members actually report that dental pain is a reason they don't show up to work. Dental pain is in the top three reasons for suicide rates. 30% of the emergency room visits are driven by dental pain. And unfortunately, when a patient lands in the ED, the emergency room physicians can't really do much to address the root cause, but other than try and tell you to find a dentist and give you some painkillers at best. And so when we think about the cost is deterrent to integrating care. Let's think again and ask ourselves, how do we measure, the, are we measuring the right cost in the full continuum of cost? The second um, myth when it comes to integrated care is this perception that we need more technology and we need more innovation. There's not enough innovation to really connect the dots. And we know that even though we've got $29 billion invested in digital health. And it, it, there's only a fraction of that is going to the areas that are really hard to reach and frankly in need of most innovation in integrated care. We run the, my, the organization I lead, Caricos Innovation Partners, run the numbers. And between 2019 and 2021, even though dental care accounts for 4% of the total cost of care in the US, Venture capital investment was less than 1% out of the total venture capital investment in dental. 
BIPOC communities or communities that are biracial, indigenous, or low income tend to receive even lower number of those investments. And so what is it that we need if it's not, to, if it's not investment funding? What I believe the answer is, is a combination of a network, a network of mission-aligned partners who understand cost, who understand whole, whole person care, and work together in the service of the end user, of the patient. We've done, we've, there are plenty of examples, I'll give you some more details, but one of those programs is actually running currently where the question was posed to global community of, in, of entrepreneurs saying, could we come up with simple, minimally invasive, integrated, low barriers to access, and equitable solutions, SMILE, that bridge the gap between social determinants, medical determinants, and dental factors that impact clinical cost. We ran this program starting in May, uh, in March. We didn't know how many solutions we we're gonna get. Uh, we ended up, we expected 30 to 40. We ended up getting over 100 applicants. And you could see the, the statistics here. We now have selected five startups out of these applicants. And what they're going to do over the course of the next 14 weeks is they'll be matched up with some of the big names that Vijay was talking about, the health insurance companies, not the dental insurance companies, the health insurance companies, the P&G companies like Colgate, the companies that have the data, the companies that have the intermediary and move things around because what well, most of these startups need is not another venture capital check or investment. They need access to customers and revenue. And that's where that connection comes in. So integrated care is about the network and the series of cascading miracles that gets people to connect the dots and those solutions to the end users. I won't show you a video in the interest of time. Instead, I'll ask Lily to move us forward to the next section of the myths around health equity. Similarly, in a very rapid fashion, I'll give you a taste of what we mean when we talk about health equity not being a good investment. As I said, um, low-income communities, at least in the US, Scott Bauman yesterday reminded us that most of the healthcare in the US is not paid for by the insurance companies. It's paid for by the government with the two government programs, Medicaid and Medicare, it's paid for by the self-insured employers. But when, when we talk about government programs, in 2020 to 2021, we actually saw 17% increase in eligible subscribers for Medicaid. That's 12 million members. That market grew by 12 million potential users in one year. We're seeing that, that multiple states are not, now not only expanding their coverage to eligible members for Medicaid, but they're also expanding the type of coverage they use. So you could see from 2014 to recently how many states are adding in extensive benefits. These are not only medical benefits, these are benefits that take care of pregnancy, pregnant women, preventative care, dental preventative care. And don't get me wrong, we are far from done. There's so much more work here. But what I'm trying to entice you and invite you is to think about all these creative solutions and innovative models and apply them to that growing market because that's where it's needed the most. I do want to give you a, an example and we'll play that video in a minute because there is another myth that says you can really scale solutions in that underserved market. And frankly, the solutions that you have to uh, innovate for those, those markets don't have to be anything fancy or shiny. They'll just take whatever's cheapest and they can afford. This is an example of a solution that was actually developed in Switzerland. And it's, um, it, it's completely changing the way we think about treating cavities and caries. The standard of care is drilling and filling that tooth which is not the most optimal or pleasant for the patient. This company came up with a solution priced in Swiss francs, so you can imagine what the cost of it was in the US, 
But the solution is literally a paste that you could put on your teeth that allows you to remineralize that tooth. And if the cavity is discovered early, you don't need a filling. You don't need to drill and fill that tooth. It restores the enamel. And so when they came to us, they said, we want to enter in the US market. The price is probably 10x of what the Medicaid or Medicare market could afford. The real innovation is to take that solution and take it to the Medicaid market. And then, again, because as I said, to scale or transcend at scale, you don't necessarily only need the funding. You need the understanding of what it's going to take. In this case, what it took was going to the board that approves CDT codes or the codes that reimburse those services and making a case that that type of solution needs to be reimbursable in Medicaid, Medicare. One state at a time. It also required changing the product packaging and the distribution and the supply chain so that we could still drop the price of that product that is meaningful when applied to a certain number of teeth. That solution is now being piloted in over 12 different clinics reaching 100,000 patients. And we are just getting started. It's, um, it's been, we've been working with that company for about eight months now. Let me, let's play that video for a second. Is it painful? Nope, not painful at all. Peridont gets absorbed by the enamel of the tooth, and then the minerals that are in our saliva get absorbed and help reharden that tooth and make it stronger. you almost go to the dentist after this video. Um, I don't know. My kids are going to watch this video and say, great, I don't have to brush my teeth. <laughs> that's right. Morning. That's it's <laughs> fantastic. I'm gonna have... Talk about unintended consequences. I mean, yes. Yeah. Tra that's transcending at scale. <laughs> it's changing behaviors. Um, so we covered some of the myths. That would be another myth, by the way. <laughs> uh, we covered some of the myths. Um, we're now at a place where we are shaping the future of health and healthcare. And there are a lot of technologies and advances in science that actually help us make those integrated care choices or health equity choices easier for us. And I do like to bring in Sumit into the conversation and ask you, what could genet genomic technology and sequencing and the advances of science do for us as we transcend in health equity or integrated care or digital for that matter? What's the promise? Uh, thanks, Maria. I just wanted to make a point about this is all about transcending, but you know you only transcend from where you start. So in very stereotypical fashion, Rob has put the chief and two Indians on stage here. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, joking aside. I'm sorry, we have no more time. We're going to wrap up. So, we are out of time. That's right. That's right. So, 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 look, I am hugely excited about the future. I think we are in the golden age of, uh, of innovation. And I think the two bits which excite me are at the intersection of um, two different fields. The first is all around genetics, in gen the geno genomic in genetic engineering, and all the wonderful stuff that we are able to do. And on the other side is computer science, where AI, machine learning, and other things allow us to interpret the data and to make some really important choices. Um, I know we are out of time, so I don't know how many seconds we have left, but um, uh, if any. But the main thing is think of the DNA as our, our operating system. And what we are now able to do is technology is able to say, look, we have got 3 billion pairs, which is it's a long string. I'm able to change specific aspects of that. Um, and I'm able to cut it. So rather than intervention through, through, um, um, through a therapeutic or through a pill, which will continue, I'm able to 
sort out that issue in that bit of the genome, which means that basically the body rejuvenates itself, right? That's the promise. I think that is hugely exciting. So imagine a future where we can say, can I make illness optional? Do I really want to be ill or do I make illness optional? The second thing is, um, you know, imagine a future when your kids and our kids grow up and they'll say, you know, you guys were so barbaric. I cannot believe that to sort that issue out, you had to cut that organ, you poked in us, you did all this stuff, which is so traumatic, you gave us toxic chemicals and had some side effects. Um, and it'll be a bit like Star Trek, where you just had, you know, um, the doc just putting that thing and everything heals because of stem cells, because of gene technology and other things. And I think that's the future which is so exciting. Now, the other observation I'd say is, look, I think we are all so stuck, and it's a, it's, it's a point about how we think about innovation. If you look at how much time we're spending on innovation, that's less than 10% of the entire panel. What we are stuck with, unfortunately, is we start from a starting point of the issues that we're facing today. We are so caught up in the issues that we face today that we sometimes miss that you know, crazy guys like me are going away, doing nibbling in the background, and then at some point, these guys turn around and say, I think we might pay for that, but can you prove it works in a million people, right? So again, so don't let your eye off the ball because this is a very, um, you know, it's an amazing audience which is very well educated and sophisticated. Keep that eye on the future and the future is all about, uh, from my perspective, is all the technology stuff that's happening. Um, as someone said to me, if you live another 20 years, you, you're going to have life extension technologies of healthy lifespan, which will allow you to live another 20 years. So that's the bonus, right? So assuming in our that's lifetime, we yeah. would we see a mRNA or CRISPR developed vaccine against cardiovascular health? I think we're already against seeing cardiovascular it. disease. Yeah, so I think we're already seeing that with COVID, right? I mean, can you imagine what it would have taken 15 years? Mm -hmm. We got it in 10 months. A new platform, a new technology, mRNA, right? That's what Moderna did. Uh, and now you look f going forward, I think that's where things are going to help. And then would we have that vaccine at the price point that the Medicaid markets or CMS could pay for it? I think look at the, look at the way some of the other uh, business models work. I mean, they're having drugs which were priced at a few hundred thousand, uh, but in the rest of the world and in other markets where they were needed, they were priced at a very different price point. Yeah. And I think, you know, you have to understand that innovation has to be paid for and reimbursed. On the other hand, you have to also understand that there's a huge market at the base of the pyramid mm -hmm. when, you, when you price it right and it's distributed right with the right ethics. I do have one more question for all of you. It's gonna be 15 seconds. That said though, time check. Do we want to play the video at this stage or not? I, I was just thinking about that. I think what we're gonna do is you're gonna conclude with your yep. 15 seconds and then we're gonna play this video. This video is produced by Chris Gebhardt. Where's Chris? Hi, Chris. Chris. Uh, Chris and his brother's uh, production company, Random Good, and this is a clip about a very important film coming out, I think, th this month, right? Well, it premiered last month. We don't know what the distribution deal will be yet, but maybe, Great. maybe in the fall. Great. About this question of genetic engineering. And so what I'd like to do is share the clip after you're done, sure. and then everybody feel free during the break, during dinner tonight, whenever, engage this topic. We want to, we're going to pick it up again next year at TWIN, and Sumit is the perfect person to have this conversation That's about right. genetic engineering with. So make your what concluding comments. Sumit We're gonna play the, the video, then we'll move optimist to have that conversation with, because well, he's, he's, he will show you the bright side. It, it's a lot more fun is. to have a drink with an optimist. That's right, yes. that's, that's all <laughs> I'm gonna say. So conclude, and then we'll play Let's, the video. That's right, so in conclusion, in one word, what does transcending at scale mean to either of you? One word. Um, to me, uh, uh, Rob makes the rules. Uh, to me, it, li it literally means transcending healthcare, right? So because right now the system is really focused on sick care. Yep. Um, but healthcare means you have access to good food, right? Access um, uh, to get education, um, financial uh, and other security, resources, social security. financial uh, security. Uh, I think those are some of the challenges that uh, consumers and patients face, and so transcending um, that and creating a system that allows a single mom that's working two jobs uh, to have access and to be able to provide uh, healthy uh, food uh, and lifestyle to her children. Great. Mr. Optimist? Inner journey. Ah. On that happy note, we um, 
Ho hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of the time we shared with you and uh, we'll continue that conversation uh, after the break. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The ability to perfect the physical and mental characteristics of every unborn child. I want dark eyes, I want blonde hair, I want then where you have two classes of people, the genetically altered elites, who have more skill, more intelligence, more talent, and the unaltered It's gonna cause massive uproar in the scientific and medical. What I'm looking for is where gene editing is headed. And more and more, the answer is China. I went to China to find out what was happening. It's a world of breadcrumbs. It's finding needles and stacks of needles. I mean, there's so much information. He is what's left of investigative journalism. He wants to tell a story. I feel like he wants to tell a story. This is part of our efforts to reverse aging in humans. So I've been involved for over a decade with companies in China. People look to George Church. He's got gravitational pull in the genomics field. There's kind of this public world, and then there's what's actually happening. Journey, but I do want some people to know what's uh, yeah. happening here. It's full, full story. Anybody can use gene editing. I've been here for a week and I found three people editing human embryos. There's a cover up. Babies whose like, genomes have been mutated as part of an international science race. When you press publish, you can't take it back. A Chinese researcher has created an international controversy over the world's first genetically edited babies. In the Lulu and Nana, your story forced a conversation. The accusation now is that you've broken the law. I don't need credit for it, but I do need to be first. The actual arrest was for state security charge. And so we went down to kind of look for him. So that somebody is not going to go. Right now, I think the situation for him is deadly serious. The real war makes people better. Make people better. Hmm. Make people better. So the, uh, the reference there, you saw the Chinese researcher, Hu Jiangqiu, who uh, created the um, germline gene edited babies. Um, I urge you to think hard about this, to engage this topic, regardless of the field you're in. It's essential. I'll also point out that while you might say, is it ethical to edit our genes, in the future, I think we'll probably look back, this is my guess, my belief, look back and say, is it ethical to not edit our genes? This is a transcendence we have to navigate together. We have no other choice.